dear brothers and sisters, dear young people. I'm uh, really glad for this opportunity to be with you. And it was nice to sing together just before. And um, I noticed that a couple of lines we have been expressing in our, our singing are just taking up also some of the thoughts which will be before us in the scripture portion we want to consider together. And that is Psalm 132. And I suggest we begin reading this Psalm. Psalm 132, a song of degrees. Lord, remember for David all his affliction, how he swore unto the Lord, vote unto the mighty one of Jacob. I will not come into the tent of my house. I will not go up to the couch of my bed. I will not give sleep to mine eyes, slumber to mine eyelids, until I find out a place for the Lord, habitations for the mighty one of Jacob. Behold, we heard of it at Ephrata. We found it in the fields of the wood. Let us go into his habitations. Let us worship at his footstool. Arise, O Lord, into thy rest, thou and the ark of thy strength. Let thy priests be clothed with righteousness, and let thy saints shout for joy. For thy servant David's sake, turn not away the, fi the face of thine anointed. The Lord has sworn in truth unto David, he will not turn from it. Of the fruit of thy body will I set upon thy throne. If thy children keep my covenant and my testimonies, which I will teach them, their children also forevermore shall sit upon thy throne. For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his dwelling. This is my rest forever. Here will I dwell for I have desired it. I will abundantly bless her provision. I will satisfy her needy ones with bread. And I will close her priests with salvation and her saints shall shout aloud for joy. There I will cause the horn of David to bud forth. I have ordained a lamp for mine anointed. His enemies will I clothe with shame, but upon himself shall his crown flourish. A wonderful um, portion of scripture and uh, of the book of Psalms we have read together. And as we uh, meditate on such portions of scripture, and in particular also portions in the Old Testament and in the book of Psalms, we should keep in mind that we can look at such portions from different vantage points. On one hand, we can just look historically to what situation reference might be made. And it's not always fully clear. Here we have some hints at least. Other Psalms give some information in the title, which they have, but that's one way to look at it. And certainly here we have clear reference to experiences and desires of David, apparently even at the time when he was not yet on the throne, but even more clearly then when he had become king and about his desire that it would not only be a place where he would reign, but the place where he would reign would be a place where really the Lord would be able to dwell in the midst of his people. We, uh, of course, have to keep in mind that the book of Psalms, in particular, is a prophetic book. And there's always this prophetic line, which actually leads us forward and looks forward to the time when the Lord Jesus himself will come and reign when he will be recognized as a Messiah and there will be this time of blessing. And of course, as we look at the book of Psalms and other portions, we always can make 
practical applications for us. And this we also want to do together as we look into this psalm now. The title of the psalm tells us it is a song of degrees. And this is actually a little book within the psalms, which is composed of 15 psalms, which have this title, A Song of Degrees. It's from Psalm 120 to Psalm 134. And in order to just make it a bit easier for you to follow now, I have prepared two slides and uh, I will just show them to you. And uh, just to help in the flow of thought before we just go back to uh, the scripture alone. Can you see this page? Yes. Yes. Okay, very good. So it's just one slide about the um, Song of the Greece, which it seems were pilgrim songs when they were going up to Jerusalem. You know that uh, God's earthly people had to appear before the Lord three times a year. And um, we have, for example, this verse I have mentioned here in 1 Kings 12, where reference is made to these um, pilgrims who went to Jerusalem. And uh, it seems from another verse, which I quote here, Psalm 42, as they went up to Jerusalem, they were singing. It says there, the psalmist expresses how I passed along with the multitude, how I went on with them to the house of God with the voice of joy and praise, a festive multitude. And there's another verse, which I mention here, you can read it yourself in Isaiah 30, verse 29, where also reference is made to this. So that seems to be behind this song of degrees. It's not fully certain, but that is definitely a thought we can have. There's this idea of progression to which these Psalms make reference. We can also think about the steps of the temple in relation to the temple mentioned in the book of Ezekiel. In a future day, there are seven and eight steps which are mentioned. You get again to 15. That is a number of songs of degrees which we have. Now, if you look more carefully, you notice that they fall into five groups of three psalms. And here I give you on the slide the five groups. And uh, it is interesting that each group begins with a psalm which conveys the thought of trouble and affliction. You have it, for example, in Psalm 120, directly the first verse, in my trouble. And similarly, in other psalms, in our psalm, which is again the first one of the last group, we read about affliction. And then uh, the second psalm, in general, indicates trust in the intervention of the Lord. And it's beautiful to see that in these songs of degrees, we find actually always a reference to what the Lord is for his people. In the first section, in Psalm 121, we remember that the Lord is called the keeper of Israel in verse 4 and 5. In the second group, that is in the, the middle Psalm is 124, it is the Lord who is for his people. It's mentioned twice in verse 1 and 2. He is a helper of Israel who has rescued them in difficult situations. In the third group, you find that the Lord is the one who builds the house. And he's not only the rebuilder of Israel, but he will truly establish them. And then in the fourth group, we um, have uh, this touching expression in Psalm 130 and in verse 8, he will redeem Israel. So we can talk about the redeemer or savior of Israel. That is what the Lord is to his people. And finally, in the last group, he is the one who unites and blesses his people as it comes out very clearly in Psalm 
133, where we find the people really united, not any longer divided, but united. And we look forward, indeed, not only that God's earthly people are united, but also God's heavenly people united around the Lord Jesus, who will be the one in the center, the one also from whom all blessing comes. The word blesser might not be an English word, but you understand what I'm saying here. And it's beautiful to think of the Lord like that. All in all, there's really a clear idea of progress. And in particular, the last psalm of each group gives this thought of triumph. And this in relation to the destination of the people of God. And in Old Testament times, that was Zion, which is mentioned again and again. And for, God, for us, of course, we think about the heavenly glory to which we are moving forward. I also mention here very briefly, when you can look it up for your own further study, in uh, each group you have one psalm which is of David, or in the central group, the third one, there's one psalm of Solomon, and then again two psalms of David in the remaining groups. Actually the Psalm 132 doesn't say it clearly of whom it is, but we can also as well attribute it to Solomon, who refers to experiences of his father David, and that is definitely uh, a main thought in the first psalm, part of this psalm. And uh, finally, this uh, brief thought that uh, if you look at the last verse in each of the three groups, 122, you have the idea of peace, peace be within thee, within Jerusalem. End of Psalm 125, peace be upon Israel. End of Psalm 128, peace be upon Israel. And then the Lord is the hope and the one for, from whom all blessing is coming. This just is a very brief overview of the songs of the grace, and I recommend them further to your study. I uh, really would like to emphasize as we are occupied with the word of God, we, of course, we want that it speaks to our hearts, but before we jump to making applications, let us first be observers and see how God is speaking through his word to us. Yesterday in the calendar, the Lord is near, we had this verse from Psalm 119, open mine eyes and I shall behold wondrous things out of thy law. That is verse 18. And uh, there you see the psalmist really as the one who is first of all, observing and that is also what we have to do as we read the word of God first step is observation how is God speaking to whom he is speaking actually also to look who is speaking in Psalm 132 which is now before us we see that the person who is speaking is not always the same actually the psalm has two parts and uh, here on the second slide, and that is the last one I have, but just to give you a brief overview of this psalm, it has clearly two parts, verses 1 to 10, where we have an appeal of David or of Solomon. You can put it as you prefer, of David and Solomon. And on the other hand, from verse 11 onwards, we have clearly the divine answer. We uh, could also say it a bit differently and say in the second part, we have really what God is saying. We have God's promises, what he intends to do. And actually, it's beautiful to see that the prayer and the appeal in the first part of the psalm is also based on the promises of God, what he has told to David, actually what he has sworn. So this uh, is really striking to see and we would like to follow up on this a bit and also make applications based on this. So keep in mind the appeal of David and of Solomon, the beginning, and then the divine answer. And then you see that 
the first part corresponds to the second or the second to the first one. I prefer to say the first corresponds to the second. And uh, in both parts, we read at the beginning about an oath, the oath of David, which is mentioned in verse two, and then the oath of the Lord, which is mentioned in verse 11. Then we have verses which tell us in more detail what David has sworn. And then we find afterwards in more detail what the Lord has sworn. And I give you the verses here that you can look them up. Then um, we uh, find that David, and we will come back to it in a moment, had this desire. He was really seeking a place of dwelling for the Lord. And that is actually something which God had told his people that they should seek the place where he would make his name dwell. And then the second part of the psalm speaks about the place whom, which the Lord has chosen where to dwell. In verse 13, the Lord has chosen Zion. This place is, in the first part, a place of rest for the Lord. And uh, the psalmist, and that, these are actually words directly from Solomon, as we find them in the second book of Chronicles, at the occasion of the inauguration of the temple, the dedication of the temple, where he said, Arise, O Lord, into thy rest, thou and the ark of thy strength. And this thought of rest is taken up again in the second part. This is my rest forever. Here will I dwell. That is verse 14. And then we see a prayer for the priest and the pious one, the saint, in verse 9. And this prayer answered in verse 16. And finally, reference is made to the anointed, to the Messiah in verse 10. And with the thought about the Messiah, this psalm is also ending. And as we will look at the details, I already mentioned here at the bottom of the slide that the divine answer, we will see it in a moment, always exceeds the prayer of David and of Solomon that is exactly in line with what we read in the epistle to the Ephesians in chapter 3 verse 20 to him that is able to do far exceedingly above all which we ask or think indeed that is the way how our God is answering prayer and uh, it's really beautiful to see this conveyed to us and illustrated to us in this psalm, which is before us. Now, if we come back now to the details, the first verse is talking about the affliction of David. He had deep exercises, and there are several of them which are strongly related with the subject of this psalm. Actually, we uh, might think first of all, the whole exercise which David had to bring the ark to the Jerusalem, this was something which went along with deep exercises because they didn't follow really the instruction of the Lord. God had to come in in judgment. And that was the first moment of affliction for David. But uh, if you go to the very end, you see also that in relation to finding the exact place where the Lord wanted the temple would be built, his dwelling place, also that went along with deep, deep exercises. We uh, remember the story in Second Samuel 24 and also First Chronicles 21, how finally the threshing floor of Ornan was identified. Where was exactly the place where the temple should be built? So you see quite clearly the afflictions of David. And last but not least, it was also him who put together all the material for the construction of the temple 
And in relation to this, we read actually in First Chronicles 22, verse 14, about the affliction of David. Yes, David was a man who had this profound exercises. And although we don't find in the historic books of the Old Testament clear reference to this oath, um, the thought nevertheless is coming out quite clearly. And David certainly realized all his weakness, all his dependence on the Lord, to whom he refers as the mighty one of Jacob. A beautiful expression which we find twice in this psalm, verse 2 and verse 5. If I counted well, and I'm glad to be corrected, I think we have it only five times in the Old Testament. The first time in Genesis 49, verse 24, then these two verses and two twice in the book of Isaiah. He addresses himself to the mighty one of Jacob, who himself, Jacob, realized his weakness. And in order to ensure the blessing, he was really dependent on the Lord. He wanted to get it by his own means, first of all, but through deep exercises, he had to learn that actually only the Lord himself is the one who can secure the blessing. And so David somehow realizes his weakness and speaks to the mighty one of Jacob. And then we have in verse three and following this exercise David had. I will not come into the tent of my house. I will not go up to the couch of my bed. I will not give sleep to mine eyes, slumber to mine eyelids until I find out a place for the Lord, habitations for the mighty one of Jacob. What an exercise. David had. He wanted to find a place for the Lord, a place where the Lord himself would dwell in the midst of his people. If you look at the state of the people of Israel at the time when David took up the throne, you see the state was pretty weak. Actually, the first book of Samuel begins telling us about the state, the moral state of the priesthood. And we read in chapter four and five, how the ark itself went into captivity. Then later on, how it came back and it was left there in the house of Abinadab in Kiryat Yerim. And uh, there's a striking verse in the first book of Chronicles in chapter 13 and in verse three, where we read about the ark of our God, we have not inquired of it in the days of Saul. So King Saul didn't care really for the ark. He didn't care really for a dwelling place of God in the midst of his people. And you see, that is really one important aspect in relation to the ark. There are a couple of verses in the second book of Samuel, but also in the Psalms, where we read about the ark and we read about the Lord of hosts who sitteth between the cherubim. Yeah, the cherubim, which were on the mercy seat upon the ark. Actually, God was really throning there in the midst of his people. So the ark we can really consider like the throne of God. And that is so beautiful about the exercise of David. You see, he had been anointed king over Israel, ruler over Israel. But David realized deep in his heart, it is God who wants to rule over his people. God must get his place in the midst of his people. That was his exercise. And he realized, my kingdom is somehow like the lower kingdom. The higher kingdom is the kingdom of God. God must rule. God must have this authority over his people, over himself. And if you think about it, what a beautiful exercise and how important 
important also for us. This deep desire we should have, and in particular also when we are still young, to submit, to surrender to the Lord Jesus and to really give him the place which belongs to him. This place of supremacy. You see, the whole line of Saul was completely different in relation to him. You know the verse in 1 Samuel chapter 15, we read that uh, actually he was not exercised to be obedient. But uh, in contrast, he was one who followed his own will. You know the verse, 1 Samuel 15, verse 22 and 23. Samuel had to say him, for rebellion is as a sin of divination and self-will is as iniquity and idolatry. And before that, Samuel had spoken to Saul about the importance of obedience and to pay, pay attention to the voice of the Lord. So in practice, that such was the life of King Saul. He didn't care for the ark. He didn't submit to the Lord. And David was someone who cared for the ark, who cared really to be submitted to the Lord, to surrender to him. And as a consequence, of course, enjoy also the blessing coming out of it. So it's first a personal exercise, but as you read uh, 2 Samuel chapter 6 or 1 uh, Chronicles chapter um, 13 and onwards, in particular uh, chapter 13, 14 and 15, you see that it was not only a personal exercise of David, but he made it a collective exercise for all the people. And indeed, if we think about it, the place where the Lord wants to dwell in the midst of his people, this is not the place where we gather around the Lord Jesus. Do we know something about this exercise for the place where the Lord wants to gather his people around himself? where he will be in the midst, where he has authority, where he can bless, where he can guide, where everything comes forth from him, where his place is truly recognized. And may such an exercise also be in our hearts, that we really ask, Lord, where will though that we gather together, that we prepare for thee a supper, that we, that we do things according to thy mind. This exercise was with David and is full of practical applications also for us. David was truly seeking a resting place for God. We have this expression in First Chronicles 28 and in verse 2 where he says, I had it in my heart to build a house of rest for the ark of the covenant of the Lord and for the footstool of our God. And you see the verses here before us in uh, Psalm 132 refer clearly to it. What was in the heart of David is really to find this place where God would rest in the midst of his people. The following verses, we see that it's not David alone, but others are united with him. We heard of it, of the ark at Ephrata. We found it in the fields of the wood. Ephrata, of course, an expression of Bethlehem that might refer to the fact that David had this exercise already when he was still in Bethlehem, the house of his father, but then he heard about it in the fields of the wood of Yaa or Kiryat Yerim, where the ark was at that time. And then we have here this expression, let us go into his habitations, let us worship at his footstool. And this is indeed what happened. You see, when David had brought the ark 
to Jerusalem. He had prepared a tent for it. We read about this in First Chronicles and in chapter 15 and uh, also later on. And you see there that it really became a place of worship. Yeah, the tent is mentioned in chapter 15 of First Chronicles in verse 1. And then there they were singing psalms. Chapter 16, verse 7. Then on that day, David delivered first this psalm to give thanks to the Lord. So the place where the Lord dwells in the midst of his people is a place where he is worshipped, where we sing his praises, where we worship at his footstool, as it is mentioned here in verse 7. And how much we are not looking forward dear brothers and sisters dear friends that we can gather together again in liberty that we can sing together and rejoice in the lord and worship him we have the privilege here in switzerland to start gathering again from tomorrow onwards but we are not allowed yet to sing together and as we are in a rented building in versoir we have to respect this but uh, Definitely, I tell you, when I come home tomorrow, we will start singing again as family, as we have done also in the previous weeks. And uh, how much we look forward to gather together again around the Lord in order to worship him as we were used to do so. Oh, that the weeks we are going through increase also in our hearts the desire to be gathered around the Lord Jesus. Then in verse 8, Arise, Lord, into thy rest, thou and the ark of thy strength. This is quite similar to what we find in the book of Numbers, where we have the journeys of the ark in the wilderness. But there's also a difference. If you look at Numbers chapter 10 and uh, verse 35, it says, Rise up, Lord, and let thine enemies be scattered and let them that hate thee flee before thy face. And when it rested, he said, Return, O Lord, unto thy myriads of thy thousands, of the thousands of Israel. You see, it's similar, the wording, but Numbers chapter 10 mentions enemies which are still there, and we have them still today as well. We are aware of it. But here, we have a time before us where enemies are not any longer mentioned, they are defeated and the Lord can enter into his rest and also the ark of his strength. And this is something which Solomon expressed when the ark was brought into the temple he had built. And in the first, in the second book of Chronicles, chapter 6 and verses 41 and 42, we have essentially the same words as we find here in verses 8 and 9 and also uh, partially verse 10. So that is actually a clear hint that this psalm is of Solomon. How beautiful are these words and how beautiful is the prayer he expressed. Uh, before I come to the details, I would like to do it directly in comparison with the divine answer. But I just want to add still briefly a few thoughts to verses 11 and 12, where we have the oath of the Lord. We don't find that often actually in the Old Testament, that God himself is swearing, making an oath. And because there is no greater one than himself, as we read in Hebrews chapter 6, he has to swear by his own. He has sworn, here we read in truth, unto David. I think there are only four occasions where we find this in the Old Testament. But what God has sworn, we find in verse 11 and 12. What is in verse 11 is unconditional. What is in verse 12 is conditional. Verse 11, of the fruit of thy body will I set upon thy throne. That means, finally, the Messiah would be a descendant of David. And yes, the Lord Jesus is the son of David. Eight times he is called the son of David in the gospel according to Matthew. Uh, 
But then in verse 12, it's conditional. If thy children keep my covenant and my testimonies, which I sh will teach them, their children also forevermore shall sit upon thy throne. And we know that this was not the case. And therefore, the history of Israel has been as we find it in the Old Testament books. Then uh, verse 13, the place the Lord has chosen, he has desired for his dwelling. And David, in turn, had the desire to find the place. He was the one who was truly seeking the place which the Lord had chosen. Yes, and this expression, uh, the place which the Lord has chosen, we have 21 times in the book of Deuteronomy, the place which I will choose, we find 21 times mentioned from chapter 12 of Deuteronomy towards the end. And I leave it to your personal study to find these references. It's a beautiful study and to relate it also to the place of gathering and what it means for us is really a wonderful study on its own. This is a place of rest for the Lord where I will dwell, he says. You see that um, it's striking in, uh, again, First Chronicles. It's God himself who said in chapter 17, that God says, I have, in verse 5, I have not dwelt in a house since the day that I brought up Israel to this day, but I have been from tent to tent and from one tabernacle to another. God had not dwelt in a house as long as his people were pilgrims. Now they had reached the place of rest. And you have this nice correspondence that David is exercised about rest for God, but God is exercised about rest for his people. And of course, all this and the final fulfillment looks forward to the day of the Sabbath rest, the day when the Lord Jesus will be recognized and honored, the day when we will be with him. But uh, for time being, indeed, our Lord desires to find rest in the midst of his people. The Lord is still the rejected one. It's striking that in uh, 2 Samuel we read when David was a rejected king. At that time, it was his son Absalom who had taken the throne. David had to run away. And when he was there in Mahanaim, we uh, read that uh, there was Barzillai coming out. And what was he bringing to David? First of all, he was bringing a bed, you see, a place to rest. I find it very striking. But uh, where the Lord is rejected, and I want to apply it also to us, he's looking for those who prepare a place of rest for him. Rest, we can truly be in the midst of his people where we are subjected to him and we are doing things according to his will, to his desire. Now, I mentioned before that uh, the divine answer goes actually beyond the uh, request which the psalmist is making. And uh, if you look at verse 15, I will abundantly bless her provision I will satisfy her needy ones with bread. That is actually something which David or Solomon had not even asked for. But the Lord is really here before us as a blesser of his people. He will bless her provision. He will satisfy her needy ones with bread. And we know how wonderfully the Lord Jesus fulfilled this when he was here on earth, how he was feeding the 5,000. The only miracle which is reported in all four Gospels. He was truly the Messiah's fulfilling what we read here about him. And then you see uh, the first prayer was actually in relation to the place of rest, verse 8, answered in verse 14. The addition we have here in verse 15, 
Then verse 9, the prayer for the priest, it should be closed with righteousness. Here, the priest shall be closed with salvation. And that, of course, goes even beyond righteousness. The full enjoyment of salvation is mentioned here. And we are reminded of the garments of salvation, which Isaiah mentions in chapter 61 and verse 10. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness, but first of all, the garment of salvation. Then the saints are mentioned again. They would shout for joy. That is a prayer in verse 9. Here we have, they will shout aloud for joy. Also that goes beyond. This um, rejoicing which uh, is there, which expresses the worship of the hearts of the redeemed ones. How wonderful. And then we look at the anointed in the two remaining verses, as the anointed one is also mentioned in verse 10. The anointed, of course, is the Messiah. And he's before us here. And we read here about him that uh, this anointed one, he will really be reigning forever. It's not limited in time. It is, uh, it is a reign which will last indeed forevermore, the reign of our Lord. There will I cause the horn of David to butt forth. Now, time is gone, but I would like to tell you this is a verse and an expression which deserves further study. The uh, footnote in the Darby translation says, beside the word um, to butt forth, it's like the word sprout, yeah, which we find in Isaiah 4, Jeremiah 33 and 23, and also in Zechariah chapter 3 and chapter 6. The Lord is the one who is a branch, who is a sprout, and these verses together tell us about his glory as we find it in the Gospels. So he is the one to whom reference is made. The one who will be the horn, this stability, this duration which is brought before us, this idea of being the, the sprout, the branch who brings forth fruit. He is also the lamb and the Lord Jesus has truly been and is the light. All these glories of the Lord are somehow referred to in this verse 17. He is truly the anointed one. And then finally, his enemies will I clothe with shame, but upon himself shall his crown flourish. And here the crown, of course, is a diadem that is on one hand royal glory, which is on the Lord Jesus. But as you see from the footnote, the word diadem actually is also the one which is mentioned for the very first time in the book of Exodus and in chapter 29 in relation to the garments of the high priest. And he had this holy diadem uh, on the turban. And uh, this is also referring to the priestly glory indeed of the Lord Jesus. He is king and priest. He is a true Melchizedek. As such, he is brought before us in this psalm. The one who uh, is a source of blessing. Blessing is found in Zion, where the Lord is dwelling in uh, Psalm 133. And out of Zion, blessing is coming forth according to Psalm 134, verse 3. But the Lord Jesus himself, to whom this psalm is making clear reference, he is the source of all blessing. And may he be really great and exalted before our hearts. And may this really motivate us to follow the Lord Jesus faithfully, to be exercised about his will, his desire, to give him the place which belongs to him in our hearts,
and also the place which belongs to him in the midst of his people. This word crown is actually also the word which is used in the book of Numbers in relation to the one who makes this vow of the Nazarite. Yeah, the Nazarite who is consecrating himself to the Lord. If you look up your Bible in Numbers chapter 6, at the beginning, the footnote actually tells us that the word crown is the word Nazar, from which the word Nazarite comes, the one who is truly consecrated to him. The Lord Jesus, of course, the true Nazarite, but maybe be such, may we be such, who are also consecrated to him, who care really for his will, who desire to follow him, to put his word into practice and to live in a way which is really for his honor and glory. May the Lord bless his word. Amen. Amen.